make sure that's on silent. It's a pleasure speaking this evening. Um, our introduction to our uh, lectureship here. Preached this sermon a while back. Just in a little, little different thought behind it. Um, there's a war going on for your mind. I think that fits in with the fact that there's more issues facing us. There's things in this world that are fighting, fighting us and fighting against the church. In 2007, a band called Flowbots came out with this song. Actually, it's called There's a War for Going Off Your Mind. These are the words, and this is kind of where the inspiration for this, script, this uh, sermon has come from. Media mavens mount surgical strikes from trapper keeper collages and online magazine racks. Cover girl cutouts throw up pop-up ads, infecting victims with silicone shrapnel. Worldwide passenger pigeons deploy paratroopers. Now it's raining pornography like lovers take shelter. Post-production debutantes pursue you in NASCAR chariots. They construct ransom letters from biblical passages and bleed mascara into the holy water supplies. There's a war going on for your mind. Industry insiders slaying test tube babies to corporate crackheads. They flash logos and blast ghettos. They embroider neckties say, embroider neckties say stop sti stitching. Conscious rappers and whistleblowers get stitches made of acupuncture needles and marionette strings. There's a war going on for your mind. Professional wrestlers and vice presidents want you to believe them. The desert sky is their blue screen. They superimpose explosions, they shout at you, pay no attention to the men behind the barbed curtain, nor the craters beneath the draped flags. Those hoods are there for your protection, and meteors these days are the size of corpses. There's a war going on for your mind. We are the insurgents. In Romans 7.23, Scripture reads, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. We must be aware of the moral issues facing and attacking the church today and be aware of that constant war that's going on for our thoughts, hearts, and actions. Peter, in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, it says, Be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And then Proverbs 24:23 reads, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. We have to be constantly aware of what is out there, because like 1 Peter says, be so revealed because your adversary, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion. He's not some gentle lamb that comes up to you and just says, hey, you might want to try this. He's a roaring lion. He comes after us. The world is coming after us. And we can see that from our subjects today, our subjects this weekend. They're tough subjects that we're facing in the world. I like to follow a site called uh, Art of Manliness. It's a website completely devoted to pretty much Theodore Roosevelt and his idea of what a man is. And they have biblical concepts to it, but recently they came out with this Sunday Firesides and short little thoughts about just life. And this one was, was out and I was going to think about using this for a devotional, but it fit perfectly into this lesson. It said here in the article, old time sailors would sometimes get the phrase hold fast as we can see here tattooed across their fingers. I kind of was curious why that was, so this article was very interesting to me. It was a reminder to stay vigilant in gripping the rigging of the ship. Without grasping the ropes firmly, a sailor could get, off, get a ship off course or be himself swept overboard by wind or wave. In our own lives, we want to hold fast to our values as well and vision for who we are and, we are, and where we're going even when we hit the storms of setbacks. We often incorrectly and unconsciously think about our core principles are so obvious, so deeply held, that keeping our grip on them will happen without effort. We think we can be spiritual without engaging in any related practices. And we think about the world today and how true that is. Stay focused on a philosophy without continually studying its insights. Maintain good character without regularly revisiting what that means. We think it's one and done. I've heard this before. It's obvious. I got it. I don't need to hear that again. In reality, without constant restraints, the ropes of our values slip out of our hands. Whatever is not intentionally kept at the forefront of our minds retreats to the back of them, where it ceases to inform our daily lives. He continues in the article here. It says, I need to go to church, um, he says once a week, but I believe more often than that, to hear things I've heard a thousand times before, but haven't already in the previous days started to let slip below my consciousness. I need to keep reading and rereading personal development books, even though they often say the same things or the 
Their insights invariably get buried in the urgency of everyday busyness. To maintain our grip on the ropes of our values, we need reminders written not on our hands, but in the books we read, the habits we perform, and the hearts of those we love and befriend. And that's what we're doing this weekend, brethren. We're doing and starting that. We're getting a reminder this weekend of what we're fighting against and how we fight against it. We need constant reminders to help us to remember the vigilant. You know, we've got a very tough, um, some tough topics, some very controversial topics. You guys have seen this, but when you look at those abortion, idolatry, homosexuality, and transgenderism, you know, that's, that's a series of sermons all on its own, but Rusk is to try to do it in one. Um, drugs, gambling, and alcohol, divorce, disobedience, parents, pornography, and then Brother Paul's going to have our conclusion. You know, this is not just an all encompassing list either of everything we face in this church. If we were doing all encompassing list, we'd be preaching for days on the moral issues facing our church. However, it's a good set of issues, it's a good set of subjects that the world and Satan is challenging us with and that we have to fight against. We're going to go back all the way back to Genesis 3, chapter 1, to see the very beginning of that there's a war going on for our minds. And that is Adam and Eve in the garden. Here we can read Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. <clears throat> Very beginning of time. Satan put words and thoughts in the minds of Adam and Eve that made them doubt God. And that's what we, we face today. We see words, advertisements, hear things, see things that are putting doubts in our minds. That is challenging our thoughts as Christians. And we have to be able to have the knowledge and the wisdom of how to fight against those. And that's what we're doing this weekend. So Satan used his words, simple words, to convince her that God wasn't telling the truth. She, he manipulated Eve. Eve then manipulated Adam and convinced Adam. And then they're both banned from the garden. Rather than we don't want to be banned from eternal life because we're convinced by the world that these list of issues that we see in front of us are okay and we can just let them go. There was a war going on for their mind and their soul. So we continue out the Bible, we can see a, a lot of moral issues that existed throughout the world. We don't have to go very far and we talk, think about Lot. Lot lived in, immoral, in such a debased cities so much that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's moral issues that was facing them. And I mean, I went a little too, um, jumped a little too ahead of myself, but my next one point was Noah. Noah lived a time that God was sorry he even made men because of their wickedness. And we look at this list that we have here, I mean, that's wickedness, it's moral issues. And we'll see here in Genesis 6, 5 through 7. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only on, was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Um, I like to craft things. I like to build things. I know Chuck does. There's nothing more depressing when when you make something, you've got to tear it all down and start over again because you messed up. God created mankind, and he was sorry that he made mankind. Just think about that. And those were, they were so wicked. 
and those moral issues that he chose to destroy. We know he won't destroy it today because he made us a promise. But brethren, that's, that's our world today. We are in a world of wickedness. And I would imagine that if God hadn't made that promise, he might be making a decision to destroy it today. And with just the Jewish people throughout all the Old Testament constantly battled with worldly people. Partially because they fought, failed to obey God. God said, destroy everyone, but they didn't. And because they didn't, those worldly people, that, those false religions, led them astray and led them astray and led them astray and led them astray. Because they didn't follow God's will and they battled with those moral issues. We can see in the book of Corinthians, Paul deals here with moral issues within the church and rumors surrounding them. In 1 Corinthians 1.11, Paul says, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. I mean, people are going out and telling Paul, hey, there's issues here. You need to address these. 1 Corinthians 5.11, is actually reported to me, reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such, such sexual immorality is not even named among Gentiles. A man has his father's wife. I mean, Paul, through 1 and 2 Corinthians, has dealt with issue after issue after issue. Some of them I wrote down here, which is an all-encompassing, is sectarianism, worldly wisdom, immorality, marriage, humility and self-denial, idolatry. And I don't plan on stepping on anybody's sermons this evening. But he just was constantly dealing with those issues within the church. So we can see and we know that words of encouragement can be a very uplifting to us. However, negative and evil words can cause us to sin and doubt the authority of God as we saw all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. And I think about, we don't have a literal talking serpent coming up to us and saying, hey, you need to eat this apple. You need to drink this alcohol. You need to worship this idol, take this drug. But what we do have in this world is hundreds if not thousands of just talking heads all day long, everywhere, in the media. Just about every advertisement we see. Um, buy this, vote on this, go to this place, go to that place. Buy this alcohol beverage. No, gamble here. No, no, gamble over here. Um, buy your marijuana here. Those are new ones that's popped up all over town now. Use this company for the best deal. Go here. It's on and on and on. We are inundated with messages of what you need to do. It's our, that's the world's agenda. I don't, I don't do social media, I don't do TV, but I drive every single day. Um, I figured it up, I drive about 27 miles one way, and then I walk for about 10 minutes between my office. Um, and it's about one and a half hours each day. What I see on that one and a half hours every single day is approximately 97 billboards one way. So I see three and a half to four billboards per mile of what's called out of home advertisement. Um, of those advertisements, obviously they changed, but this was just my account last week. Seven of them are for casinos. Three are alcohol beverages. Three are for marijuana. And that's just one way. I was going to count the ones one way the other day coming home, and I got distracted and went the wrong way. Um, some of them are digital. I get to see more and more. And, you know, one, one billboard, I can see five messages before I ever pass it, all telling me to do something different. And it's just a billboard, right? The thing is, is there's a war going on for your mind and money. They want you. They want your things. And I, I say they're just billboards, and, but people notice billboards. So a recent study by Mixed Media Outdoors from July 18 says that Americans spend an average of 17,600 minutes in their cars every year, more than 293 hours annually. The average person drives between 31 and 26.2 miles per day. Um, depending on the season, and adults 30 to 49 log the most miles behind the wheel at 13,506 per year. A survey was done by Arbitron that showed huge levels of engagement for those advertisements. The company found that two-thirds of respondents reported seeing a billboard in the past month. 80% of billboard viewers looked at the advertising message some of the time and half did all the time. Even those on public transportation, um, including airports for those of us that fly. You see those all the time, every bathroom and everywhere you go. Noted the billboards with 66 of bus and taxi riders saying they had seen one the previous month. Again, that neglects the claim that says people are on their phone. Um, they're always looking at the phones. They're actually seeing billboards. 
23% of the respondents have gone online to find information about that advertiser, and 16% have visited the advertiser's website after a billboard piqued their interest. So that's just, like I said, that's what I deal with all the time um, because it's what I do. So it's, it's what drove me for those facts for this. So what is all that advertising worth? Why are they doing this? Why are they putting 97 billboards in a 27 mile distance? How come they, they want to do that? Um, so here's digital ad spending per year from 16 to 18. Sorry, this one is. This is how much they spend. There you go. Got those slides out of order. Sorry. Um, 125.75 billion dollars is what they propose to spend in 2019 on digital ad spending to get you to spend your money. That's what your mind and your money and your soul is worth to the world. And that's a raise, you know, from almost $50 million from 2016. And that, this, this is digital, so you're talking just everything outside of, um, you know, TV, televisions, laptops, phones, um, laptops, PCs, and other internet devices. So you can see there's a war going on for your mind, um, money, and soul. So why are they willing to spend so much? Because Google proposes to make $102 billion off of you this year. $102 billion is how much they propose to make off of digital advertisements. Facebook, 67.2, and I don't know what some of those other sites are. I know Amazon and um, Microsoft. They are after our minds. They are, the world is after our minds and after our money. Um, it's profitable and it's everywhere. If we looked at advertising medium, so this is how much um, their each group is doing. So you got mobile advertising, TV, desktop, laptop, print, radio, out of home. You got to think out of home is 3% and that's what I deal with most of the time and I see 97 advertisements a day one way. Um, and then directories. It's how much the share of their spending is. You know, a point what I'm getting to is it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Um, unless you become a hermit and really how you do and what you do to guard yourself, the world has some type of media that's made to influence you to their agenda. And that agenda, 99.9 .9 to infinity times, is against God's will. I looked up this interesting stat. There are approximately 68 24-hour news television stations all willing to spill their, spew their agenda at you. Um, and then this is just the spending, how much uh, digital ad spending. The average American spends 444 minutes every day looking at screens, or 7.4 hours. That breaks down 147 minutes spent watching TV, 103 minutes in front of a computer, 151 minutes on a smartphone, and 43 minutes with a tablet. And what does it work to them? Super Bowl ad costs $5.1 to $5.3 million for a 30-second ad. $255,000 per second for them to get their agenda out to you. And I didn't pay attention to Super Bowl, but last time I watched much TV, Almost every one of those agendas has something in there that's got homosexuality and lesbians in them. All those commercials, they're spewing their agenda at us. Um, top rated TV show right now, one of them is called This Is Us. It costs $433,000 for a 30 second ad. Billboards can cost up to $30,000. Magazines can cost from $1,500 to $250,000 per size and location, and that 2019 annual spending of all advertising in 2018 was found to be $151 billion. That's what our minds, our body, and our souls is worth in the U.S. to the world and to Satan.
the U.S. is willing to spend $151, $151 billion to convince you of the agenda. And 125.7, as we see here, of that is digital spending. Brethren, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, Ephesians 4.14. We can't be convinced by this. We have to be aware. The world puts a lot of value in convincing us to go against what the Bible teaches. Now that I've got all those statistics out of the way and all that information, how do we, what do we need to fight against this? What do we need, what tools do we need to fight against Satan, fight against the world, and fight against all these agendas that are being thrown in your face? We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I've underlined several points here that we're going to go through one by one. And these are what I see that we have to have in order to fight against all these moral issues attacking the church. We have to have the truth. You all can probably quote the verse I'm getting ready to, and that's John 17, 17. Saying to them, by, the, by your word, your word is truth. We have to have truth. We have to have the gospel. We have to study the word to understand what we need to be able to do and how we can fight against these agendas. We have to have righteousness. Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words says, Righteousness is the character or quality of being right or just. It was formerly spelled right wiseness, which I find very interesting, which clearly expresses the meaning. It's used to note an attribute of God, the context of which shows that the righteousness of God means essentially the same as His faithfulness or truthfulness, that which is consistent with His own nature and promises. We have to be righteous. We can't go out and fight against more issues of the world if we're living a life of sin. We have to be right, have right wiseness. We have to have attributes of God. We can't be in the world or be of the world and fight against the world. Next, we have to have the gospel of peace there in verse 15. Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible, the preparation of the gospel of peace signifies a prepared and resolved frame of heart to adhere to the gospel and abide by it which will enable us to walk with a steady pace in the way of religion, notwithstanding the difficulties, dangers that may be in it. Resolved frame of heart. There's oftentimes people get challenged and they just wilt. They don't have resolve. We have to have resolve to be able to fight against these things within peace. It is styled the gospel of peace because it brings all sorts of peace. Peace with God, with ourselves, and with one another. And all, it may also be meant of that which prepares for the enter entertainment of the gospel, namely repentance. We have to be at peace with the brethren, with the church, in order to be able to fight against all of these. Next, um, we have to have faith. 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. Faith in God. What are we fighting for? Faith that no matter the outcome, when we're fighting against these moral issues, God is going to deliver us. 
We might be persecuted. We might be marked. We might be blackballed by friends and family. But God's going to take care of us because we're following His will. 1 John 5, 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith, with our faith, we can overcome the world and fight against the world. We have to have salvation. Um, we have to have the hope that there is an end to this world of pain and suffering. As the song goes, there will be no tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There will be no sadness, all will be gladness when we shall join that happy band. We need to understand that there's salvation at the end of it all. We fight. We do the right things. We're living according to God's will. We have salvation in the end. Without that hope, there's no need to fight against it all. That's why a lot of the world doesn't fight against this stuff. They have no hope. 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest of these is love, but we have to have hope. Hope, hope faith, and love. Hope in heaven. We can know that no matter the persecution, no matter the results, no matter what happens with our friends and family, co-workers, there will be nothing compared to the glory, glory we see in heaven. We have to have the sword of the Spirit. We can't have any of those things without the sword of the Spirit. But we know the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We can't fight against the world on our own accord. The only way we can fight against the world, the only way we can fight against these moral issues is with the Word of God, with the sword of the Spirit. To, have, to do, be able to do that, we've got to study it. We've got to have the biblical wisdom. Um, and... What we've been studying recently through Wednesday Night in Proverbs is just perfect amount of biblical, per perfect biblical wisdom as described in the book of Proverbs. All the wisdom and the knowledge it talks about. And lastly, we have to pray. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now Christ is saying that to the apostles. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. We have to pray. That is one that's really easy to let slip. I let it slip from time to time, not thinking about the importance of it. Romans 12, 9 through 13 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another, with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, steadfastly in prayer. Distributing the needed saints. Given to hospitality. I look at this as seven things that we have to have in order to fight against the world, to fight against Satan, to fight against the evil and the moral issues, everything we have going on. And this is an opportunity for us this weekend. I look at it as a great opportunity for us all to gain knowledge about the issues we face, Gain and strengthen our weapons against Satan in the world. There's a war going on for your mind, body, and soul. Tonight I issue us a challenge. Challenge each and every one of you here and those that might be watching and those that are, will come. I want you to look at each sermon presented on those, these various subjects we've talked about. The idolatry, the homosexuality, all of these lessons. Oop. Too fast for it. Drugs, gambling, alcohol, divorce, disobedience to parents, pornography. And I'm sure there will be others touched on that. But when we're going through each one of those subjects, I'm challenging each and every one of us, myself included, when we're looking at that, ask yourself these questions. Do I have the truth of the matter at hand? As we said in Ephesians chapter 6. Am I righteous or have an attitude of righteousness about this lesson? Do I have the gospel of peace? Do I have that right frame of mind? And that, um, 
What was that word you used a minute ago? The resolve. Do I have that resolve to fight against this issue? Do I have the right type of faith? Do I have the faith I need to be able to stand up against these issues in the world? And do we have salvation and hope, which gives us hope we need to get through those tough times? When we're facing those challenges, when we're being beat down. Do we have the sword of the Spirit? But not only that, do we rightly divide the sword of the Spirit on those issues? Are we rightly dividing it when we're talking to people, when we're confronting people, when we stand up? And lastly, am I praying about these issues at hand? That's my challenge for us for this entire lectureship. I hope and pray everybody can be present for it and we can look at those. Because brethren, there's a war going on for our minds and we are the insurgents and we have to fight for God and we have to fight for the church because the world is not going to fight for us.